Hello and welcome to the Palladium Podcast. I am your host, Wolf Tyvee, Editor-in-Chief of Palladium. I am joined today by a very special guest, Samo Buria of Bismarck Analysis. Welcome, Samo. Good to be here with you, Wolf. All right. So we've had Samo on before. Um, Samo is, like I said, founder of Bismarck. Um, and and he's been writing for Palladium occasionally over the past few years as we've gotten this project going. Um, we're obviously huge fans of Samo's work, very much influenced by his work on great founder theory, um, really an interesting theoretical framework to, to analyze how society works and, and therefore, of course, how to change it. Um, one of Samo's recent things that, that you guys have been up to at, at Bismarck that, that we're very interested in um, and sp- inspired by is, is uh, your Bismarck brief. So Bismarck Analysis has started putting out the subscriber newsletter. So that's been very interesting to see you guys put that together and the level of high quality analysis you've been putting out on that uh, for subscribers. So I, I, just before we get into the main topic today, which is going to be your article that got into Palladium 4, I just want to hear a little bit about what's the thinking there? What are you trying to offer? We find it sort of interestingly aligned with what we're trying to do. So so we're very fascinated by it. Honestly, the high quality of Palladium articles has been one of the main reasons I keep returning to the magazine and writing for you. You're one of the only people that engage constructively and deeply with theory. So, you know, it's a mutual admiration. I never, I never feel like the integrity of my article was violated when your editors touch it, you know? <laughs> right. Yes. I wish I could the say idea. the same about <laughs> other publications. Um, so the Bismarck Brief, uh, which listeners can find at brief.bismarckanalysis.com. The goal there was to produce sort of a weekly in-depth case study into a particular live player or organization. Uh, We've looked currently at, say, Turkey's ability to bootstrap a drone industry. We've looked at uh, Frontex, which is Europe's border control agency and how it's pushing European integration. We've looked at Blackstone um, and other U.S. financial institutions. I basically wanted wanted to find a way to make available the kind of reports Bismarck has produced uh, for, you know, our ultra high net worth uh, individual clients. Uh, people, you know, who have these strong interests in understanding uh, the truth of the matter, what the situation is, information that's sort of timely and actionable. I wanted to find a way to make that available to a broader audience while still keeping mm-hmm. it economical. And very much in this frame of my theories, it isn't presenting theory as much as it is presenting concrete case studies. Over and over again, a 10 to 20 page report on, let's say, uh, you know, the conflict between uh, France and Turkey in the Mediterranean, or a look at China's solar industry, stuff that's like very much applied applied theory of the kind that me and my team have been, you know, using for 10 years. Um, I'm hoping some of uh, your listeners find this brief interesting and consider subscribing. I've been very pleased with the positive response we've received, and uh, I hope that we can you know, continue providing signal rather than noise and help uh, shape some of the decisions our elites make today. Right. And so speaking of elites, uh, you know, both the people who are hopefully reading your material and the people who, who we're often analyzing uh, in, in, in both of our work, this brings us to the article of the day, which is Samo's article on rising elites. So this was published uh, mid-2020. It was a very interesting article going over basically how the elite, the the position of the elite within society, how they work, how they contribute to society, and how people rise and become new elites, and how that sort of elite circulation mechanism works from a sort of practical individual perspective. So we found that very interesting. We put it into Palladium 4. Palladium 4 is our latest print edition. It came out uh, very recently. It's, It's shipped out. People have been receiving it. Uh, the subject of Palladium 4 is cultivating elite. So we're looking at this broad problem of how do we create a functional benefit, benevolent elite? Um, and what, are, what are the institutions involved in that? What are the lifestyles involved in that? What are the personal paths? And that's, of course, where Samo's article comes in. So Samo, I'd love to hear your perspective on this article, whether you would update anything in the last year and a half since it's been published um, originally. And, and just like, 
how do you see the major argument there? What are we talking about with rising elites? And then we can go from there into whatever strikes our fancy. Well, unsurprisingly, we both have a shared interest in uh, societies that have functional institutions, societies that are you know healthy, dynamic civilizations that provide solid seems important. Stand- we have solid standards of living, solid, uh, you know, orientation towards real goals. But the interesting thing here is that I think we also agree that often, you know, and this is why I suspect you guys dedicated a whole issue to this topic. Um, I think we both agree also that often the political decisions and the possibilities of institutional reform, they really come down not to the elites versus the masses or something like that but more the balance of power and the patterns of cooperation and competition between rival elites. And then these rival elites might occasionally, say, mobilize the masses of people, or they might undertake uh, projects of institutional reform, right? Like I would just name the Jesuits as a strange example where within 30 years of the founding of that religious order, they, uh, you know, had universities on every continent and had toppled like three or four governments. <laughs> right. and, you know, they were tr- contesting the papacy. It took centuries, by the way, because almost all other Catholic factions like oriented to try to stop the Jesuits from getting the Pope. Uh, you know, that finally happened with Pope Francis. He is, uh, you know, the first uh, Jesuit Pope. So we'll see how that works out for the Catholic Church. But joking aside, like that you know, the Jesuits, like that's not a conspiracy theory. That's like a socioeconomic force. It's an organized one. Not all elites are organized, right? You could think of, say, the rise of capitalist uh, elites in 19th century Britain to be an example of a disorganized elite that sort of joined, uh, you know, the ranks of an older merchant elite. And even before that, an aristocratic elite that was still around in Britain that was uh, still practicing, not just you know, management of the land, but even martial virtues, right? In the 19th century, you still had British aristocrats sailing ships uh, to reach, uh, you know, remote corners of the world and make their name there and then go back to London and sit in parliament. Arguably, that was much the same as as it had been 200 years earlier. So a lot of social changes are down to changes in the composition of elites, the nature of elites, how they work, And one of the things I think people don't realize is that while the surface, you know, the surface image of being elite, that's really competed over, right? Like you had, even in medieval Europe, you had wealthy peasants trying to dress like noblemen until the noblemen slapped them down with sumptuary laws and told them, no, actually, your role in society is different. You don't get to wear that color, okay, friend? You better it's, not it's wear not that a consumer color. choice. It's not a it's consumer, not a consumer choice. choice. Exactly. Well, what I'm saying is the peasant wanted the clothes of a noble, but I think they did not actually want to be a noble. I think they didn't actually want to take on all the social responsibilities. Sure, they might want the material privileges. Sure, I'm not saying that you know the peasants weren't oppressed and misused at times. However, I think there's a very real difference in mindset. So it's shockingly effective. If you just attempt to become an elite, but you attempt to become a different new kind of elite, don't try to just, you know, inch your way into Yale. Try to prototype what is the thing that replaces Yale, that replaces Harvard, right? Or the thing that, you know, replaces tech companies. And I I was trying to open the door theoretically in this fruitful overlap of personal economic and political choices that people make. And how does this connect to a theory of change of how their actions could actually change political society? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So historically, we see, obviously, that, that as you mentioned, um, most change in society comes down to these movements within the elite. It, becomes, it comes down to you know the people who have some level of power or are coming into some level of power. They're going to take society in some new direction. They have some different vision for how things are going. Maybe that's caught up in their own sort of material interests. Maybe not. But we don't want to make the mistake of reasoning from that to like, oh, that's just the people who have crawled to the top of the current institutions or the people who are at the top of the current institutions. Because you also have this process that you're alluding to, which is that often the new energy that's actually driving the thing is is new, new types of the institutions elite. yeah new yeah. entrance to the elite via new institutions and 
so that's really interesting so it's like it be like the elite is sort of where the action is but but you like where that comes from is not people kind of climbing up and getting the best grades at yale it's 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 people who are finding ways to do something outside of the established order and build some new part of established order that they they rise with this new part of the order so that's very interesting um and i find that this is this is sort of you know, n- not how people seem to think about it. You you see a lot of people, you know, they want their kids to be elite. They want to like send them to the elite schools, give them the elite education and so on. But it's, it's very much this formulaic within the existing institutions thing, because it's not, it's sort of like the, the medieval peasant thing. Maybe they actually don't want the, the level of risk, the level of, of dealing with reality that comes with uh, the the true historical path or the true path that we see in in history. Anyway, so I found that very fascinating, and and I, this is what you're trying to do in your article is articulate this that there is this other path and what that looks like. How does how do these new elites rise by a combination of sort of being useful and and having some new source of power? I mean, it's it's folly to join an organization as an individual to try to change it from the inside, right? Like the machine grinds you down. We both know very enthusiastic interns who went to DC or went to join a large tech company and had these ideas of changing it. They end up accomplishing very little except power the machine a bit more. Okay, it's a bit smarter to try to say do entryism with your ideological friends. Uh, You know, classic communist parties did this fairly well. You know, less sinister ideological movements have also succeeded in doing this at times. But these are ultimately these kind of self-similarity strategies where if they are competing with someone in the same tools, the same methods that uh, the game has been set up in, I think their impact is low, right? When it comes to politics, the main effect of your actions is the games you are playing, to acquire political power. Like that's what defines political economy. Look, if you have a problem that is downstream of political economy, that is the economy of political actions, you must invest and invent new modes of power and you must pursue those. And I think that the left has done a remarkable job through the course of the 20th century in innovating in these things. Uh, Very occasionally say right-wing movements also innovate in this. And I, you know, I'm not elevating the left versus right here. I'm just noting that, you know, when I when I think about someone like Vladimir Lenin, when he talks about the vanguard party, what he is constructing is a justification for an elite of the proletariat, or rather an elite ruling on behalf of the proletariat. First off, a cognitive elite, secondly, a social elite. And in his essays, you know, particularly the what is to be done, he lays out a blueprint for how to turn book groups into party cells. And this is an important technical innovation because it's hard to remember, but the political party that was later, of course, also say used by fascists and, you know, also more technocratic movements like the People's Action Party of Singapore is actually of the same basic design. What we think of today as a, you know, single party state type system that's kind of invented by Lenin, that's new, therefore it's a source of power. Wolf, I guarantee you that if you wanted to reform modern China, the way to do it is not to create a new Chinese Communist Party within China that already <laughs> right, exists, yeah. right? right. The powers mined out. And the same goes for the US. You know, there's no point in creating a third party, a third Democratic Party. Like, why? There's already the Republicans, there's the Democrats. They mined out the power that there, that there is to be had in that. You right, know, that mode people, of power already exists. Right, people want to imitate... Their immediate elites they can already see. If they're smarter, like not if they're smarter, but if they're more inspired, they sometimes hope to bring about a return to an elite that was once powerful and now no longer is. For example, I think Confucius sort of incorrectly read the history of his own civilization and assumed kind of like enlightened poet bureaucrats had actually, you know, um, guided things well in the early Zhao dynasty. Though in reality, it was probably more like bloodthirsty nobles, um, much more vigorous. But still, in this misunderstanding of his history, he engineered something new that was actually a better political order than what the, the Qin dynasty had to offer with its narrower legalist philosophy. 
So that's the second stage. And the third one, the, the best one of all, is to do something that's not been done before, right? So in this sense, I'm not endorsing the result of Vladimir Lenin's you know, party state necessarily, but it's, it's first rate political action, it's first rate desire. And you know what? Vladimir Lenin, he tried to do the equivalent of going to Yale. He flunked out of the civil service exam for Russia's, uh, you know, imperial bureaucracy. So, you know, maybe if any imperial bureaucrats are listening to, you know, listening, you know, maybe sometimes you should let the Vladimir Lenins of the world into your elite circles, because otherwise they form a pressure that replaces you. Well, this is, yeah, I mean, I wonder, I wonder how possible that even is, but you, you do see this pattern of, of, you know, various people who had some kind of relatively more normal ambition uh, through the established institutions, you know, maybe they have big dreams, but they want to go and do it through the established channels, but they basically flunk out of those channels because those channels have become so saturated with, with the, like the, the striver type, the people who are just like clawing all over each other's faces to, to get to the top of this uh, established hierarchy, but that that's actually not, you know, that's not the kind of environment where those people with with that different type of thinking are actually they're not optimized for that. That's not where they succeed. And so th this this brings up this interesting notion of there's there's sort of different types of competence, right? So you have competence within a competitive game that's established, and you have competence in sort of forging new paths and forging new games uh, through unestablished territory. And and it's often the people uh, with the latter talent that are sort of creating the world, um, but but it, it, it ends up, the established institutions end up saturated by the people kind of with the former talent. And this, this is maybe by, by design, right? Like, it's like you're saying, um, joining some institution to try to change it from the inside well, that's not the reason people found institutions. They don't found institutions to, to change, to, to be changed from the inside. They found institutions to multiply and accelerate a particular initiative that they want to, to apply to the world. And so they, they start recruiting people who can make that thing more powerful as it exists. They, they say, here's this thing that I want to do. I need more people that are going to make this more powerful. So when you're joining an institution, because the person who designed it probably was successful in, in designing it in, in that secure manner, what you're really doing is you're lending power to that organization. You're lending power to that institution. And, and so that, that can be a very valid thing to do. If you say, you look at the world and you say, here's an institution. This is the kind of thing I like in the world. I want to go and join that, add my effort to that. But, but like you say, it's, it's like, you don't, you don't have success by joining it and saying, I'm going to steer it in this other direction to steer it in some other direction. You need some kind of outside source of power or some innovation that, that makes you de facto operating outside of that power structure. But yeah, coming back to the, the Lenin question, I mean, I, I think I think it's like it's it's actually impossible somehow structurally for the established institutions to be designed in such a way to um, metabolize these these people who who operate out of outside of the established games. It may be possible to create room for them in society overall. That's an interesting question. Maybe we should talk about that. But go on, Samo. I think it's perhaps impossible to once you've established a ostensibly meritocratic system one based on written and verbal argumentation uh, applied by a bureaucracy to make exceptions for genius. And if you do not make exceptions for political genius in your political system, and this is actually a point, you know, this is actually a point that, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln makes in the Lyceum Address. So this is, you know, this is hardly crazy out there theory. This was mainstream politically understood in the 19th century and the 20th century, you need to make room for exceptional political genius or exceptional political genius will make room for itself at your expense. No, really, right? So I think actually the British aristocracy, uh, you know, I think they had many flaws. They were decayed. They were failed. However, their great virtue was they understood that they are losing power. So they agreed to sort of move aside to the capitalist elite. Now, ideally, they would have been more dynamic and would have found a way to you know, match the best virtues 
of a capitalist elite and the best virtues of an aristocratic elite. But at the end of the day, you know, there are still people descended from Normans who are running Britain. Even today, if you analyze last names. Which you can't say for France. Which you cannot say for France, right? In France, like people who are descended from aristocrats, they give these nervous interviews where you look at the interview and uh, the person asks them, so why do you have such a big house? And they're like, oh, but we're like, we're a museum. We provide so much local culture, you know? And you can tell that there's still terror in the eye of this Frenchman, this like 60 year old Frenchman. And it's been 200 years since the revolution, but the chop chop sound of the guillotine still terrifies him. <laughs> right, right. Right? Like, yeah, I mean, th this reminds me of the story, um, what you say about the, the British aristocracy in some way stepping aside or making room. It's it, like there was this immense amount of dynamic political energy coming from to sort of the upper bourgeois in 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 England um in Britain I guess more broadly and a lot of that energy was just going all over the place I mean you see this with Cromwell right like it, Cromwell um led a lot of those people and they caused a big problem for the the traditional aristocratic class but it's interesting sort of right after that with with Charles II he somehow manages to engineer the status landscape so that instead of doing puritan revolution or instead of being a total pirate you become a gentleman scientist and a captain of industry and that became this kind of productive outlet for ambition and so they created a landscape where people could have a productive outlet for their ambition but it, and it wasn't just like oh we're going to harness your energy to totally keep our system going it was we know we understand that this is like you know, there's a new elite coming in here. We're going to make a good deal with them. And and that's that's kind of, this is sort of from the perspective of an existing elite looking at this problem. You have all this political ambition running around. How do you, a lot, how do you give it a productive outlet that doesn't attempt to suppress it, like ultimately suppress it? And I think this is an interesting problem with, I mean, this is one of my critiques with a lot of, um, established things like the, the VC startup ecosystem, a lot of that looks like you take all this productive ambition, but you're actually, it's it's over harnessed. Like the, the people founding those companies are not actually getting enough out of it. And I think that that's uns therefore unsustainable as a question of political economy. Um, and I've, so I've, I've critiqued the idea of like going into startup founding to my friends and so on because of that problem that, that actually it's a fake sort of ambition outlet it was a real it was a real thing in 1995 in 2005 i think there are people who did remarkable things by working in software um but i think once it became commoditized and standardized ironically you know by people like paul graham uh you know deeply insightful people they made yc like a, a startup factory well if as soon as something is a factory then you know you are a factory worker yeah, you're a factory worker or or a factory product, right? You're standardized. You're you're Six Sigma, right? Of course, right. Like Six Sigma in the sense that you you the way you eliminate trouble is by reducing variance, right? You don't try to diagnose the concrete thing that went wrong with your car that caused it to explode or your country to cause it to have a revolution. You instead just try to standardize every single input. Arguably, Six Sigma was like the governing ideology of, uh, you know, uh, people like J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI or the early CIA people uh, in the 1950s when they embarked on an active campaign to re-engineer American society to standardize it. And I can't help but think about the standardization of dissent as well as an important tool. But the, the you know, there's, I always, I always I, you know, when I go back to Slovenia now, I find people who are, uh, you know, quoting uh, Mises and, you know, this is fine and they own guns and uh, they work out. And I'm like, this is so alien to the native Slovenian right wing tradition, which is weird Catholic clericalist type of integralism. But it is being distributed through the Internet and it's it's not clear it's actually keeping America free. Honestly, it could be it's a distraction. Uh, if I take their goals, their their self perception is that they're keeping America free. But I'm like asking, are you actually? Um, but to go back to to the more interesting point, 
I think there's a dynamic, unless you study elites, that is not obvious, which is how often ruling elites sell out to the new elite. I think there's a there's like a dissident version of this where the view is as, oh, the elite buys out or causes new entrants to sell out. But when I look at history, it's much more often that the old elite, you know, I criticize the peasants. Now let me criticize the aristocrat. Often the aristocrat just wants to wear the nice clothing and does not like the 50% mortality rate. You know, when Alexander the Great takes the throne of Macedonia, if you look at his ancestors, like, or his predecessors, the odds of, you know, being killed as the king of Macedonia are about 50%. Like, his yeah, dad wasn't was his assassinated. Father assassinated? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Isn't it much better to be Queen Elizabeth II than it is to be Philip II? You still get to wear the nice clothing. You still have a big house. You're just not responsible for anything, and you're not blamed for anything. The prime minister is blamed for everything. So if you want to grill, if you want to grill as an elite, grill mindset, right? You become Queen Elizabeth II. You do not become Philip II. You do not become Alexander the Great. You retire. You accept your place in a golden cage. Say the emperor of Japan historically was also someone who accepted his place in a golden cage. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, like the emperor of Japan in res- in exchange for security gets... Um... And, and, and sort of loss, but he, he gives up all, all any kind of ambition. But in, in response, he doesn't just get security, right? He actually gets to, he be, gets to be the Pope of Japan, right? Like the, 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 em- the emperor is like the Pope of Japan, right? Like there is a real new position there. That, that that's, is that's true. interesting. It's perhaps not too powerful, but it is at least ceremonially interesting. I will say, I think the Pope of Japan is a real position. That is the emperor of Japan is a real position. And I think QE2, Queen Elizabeth II has the possibility of starting like the English papacy, basically. There's, by the way, a fun argument that, you know, uh, the English crown, the British crown, went in the course of fighting the papacy became much like the papacy. But that's that's a, a whole other can of worms worth its own podcast. Uh, th- there was a deep cold war between the Protestant and the Catholic world. Every sort of thing you think is unique to... Uh, capitalism versus communism with you know the kgb or the u.s running around doing things almost everything was prototyped during the great struggle between protestantism and catholicism all of these um you know intelligence operations these proxy wars all of that stuff yeah the propaganda yeah exactly like the reason we think the spanish inquisition is evil today is because of you know uh, 17th century uh, pamphleteers right it's not it's not even so-called social justice warriors in campus today that cause us to think the Inquisition is evil. It's 17th century like rabid Protestants writing about it, creating the so-called black legend, which, you know, still has some reality to it. The Spanish didn't do everything right. And the Inquisition, I'm sure, had its victims. But the point on the papacy, like the king of Belgium, okay, he's not the Pope of Belgium. That's an example of someone that actually just abdicated power for safety. Say the king of Sweden, let's say he gets to issue the Nobel Prize. So I actually think esoterically, the king of Sweden is secretly usurped uh, the, the queen of Britain. I think he has, you know, I think esoterically, the Swedish monarchy is now, they are the kings of science because they own the Nobel. And I think Britain should uh, should viciously boycott boycott the Nobel Prize because they should own science, right? They made the Royal Society. Yeah, but but this implies this implies ambition at the top level. I mean, the whole point of selling out is like you you've you've become exhausted as a class, and you don't you don't want the challenges of ambition anymore. And to, I, I say I say to my left wing friends, by the way, that they they are picking the wrong enemy. And and by the way, I I don't think of myself either as left or right wing at this point anymore, but. I feel, especially my more Marxist influenced friends, they obsess over capitalists. And I'm like, you know, your whole argument is that our economy works exactly the same if the capitalists aren't there. Do you realize that the capitalists might know this? And do you realize that there was a whole separate change of power that happened in the early 20th century, the so-called managerial revolution? Uh, Kojeve and other theorists wrote about this in the 1950s. The transfer of power from capitalists, capitalists as captains of industry, to capitalists as people in whose name things are done. I think capitalists are are much less powerful in our society 
than uh, most people think. And it's one of the main reasons Marxist analysis stopped working because Marxist analysis fundamentally has no strong answers, at least the orthodox Marxist-Leninist version, for the problem of the manager, the hired manager, right? It doesn't matter if the hired manager works for the Ministry of Economic Planning or if they work, uh, you know, if they work for Bill Gates, uh, they have the same type of class interest. This class interest is distinct from the class of owners. Uh, to give a strong example, this is most obvious in philanthropy. Consider the personal goals and values of Henry Ford versus the goals and values of the Ford Foundation. <laughs> like, isn't yeah. that a clear very, evidence very that the capitalist was replaced around 1920 with someone like the person who is the staff member at the height of the commanding heights of the foundations and the corporations are held by the manager class today? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's this fascinating reading of the first half of the 20th century where it's everyone is kind of grappling with this fact that the capitalists are basically exhausted as a class or, or somehow obsolete. And and this managerial thing has had the, the sort of the, the scientific professionalized management has become powerful and mature enough that it can almost replace the capitalist. And and what what does that mean for society? Like you get the more revolutionary expressions of that, like, um, you know, with with fascism and communism. Uh, and and it's, you know fascinating things going on, especially uh, the ones I'm familiar with in in Japan. Um, just like their whole their whole wartime technocratic bureaucracy, that whole system. But, but even how the Zaibatsu system, the Zaibatsu system, seamlessly integrated into the techno technocratic aspects of the state. Right. Yeah. So so you have this fascinating thing going on, but then one reading of what came out of it, liberalism as we understand it, is that it was. It was sort of this ceasefire deal between the existing capitalist elite and and the the sort of managerial elite and and the the terms of the deal it, it, you know something like basically how the the British uh, upper class engineered this golden cage thing it's it's basically like okay you get to keep your money you get to keep your wealth and your privilege you get to keep your nominal ownership of everything. Um, and and you get to keep extracting from the system, but you no longer really have political power. You no longer really have independent uh, individual agency. Uh, so you lose all that in, in exchange. The managerial class is going to take over and run things, but they're not going to run things with the level of sort of philosophical teleological rigor that would would remove the the nominal owner from the thing uh, or, or like would open those questions of what happens when you remove the nominal owner. The entire critique I would have of, say, you know, the World Economic Forum when I attended Davos a few years ago was the observation that this obsession with stakeholders, right? And I know possibly the obsession with stakeholders in running a company is better than an obsession with shareholders, because I do think there are things beyond profit maximizing. But this is basically like it's an anti it's an anti founder perspective. Like the view is that the responsible thing for Elon Musk to do is to spend uh, is to spend about five billion dollars building the biggest yacht ever, and that he should never build a new company, and that's the opposite of what I think would be economically productive. You know, I want to be provocative and declare Elon Musk a part of the proletariat. I sort of feel Elon Musk. He should not invest. Right, he anything. does real work. <laughs> he, he should never do stocks. He should never be like. He should just. Spend a hundred billion dollars on a new crazy and insane company. And I guarantee you, Wolf, he's going to receive far worse press if he spends a hundred billion dollars on a new company than if he spent it on giant yachts and big parties yeah. and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, this, this, this is exactly what I'm love, saying, right? Because he's a love he's Hollywood a celebrities. He's a throwback. He's, he's, he's archaic. He's a right. He's a throwback to the old old capitalist order of founder capitalism, which was you know captains of industry instead of the the golden cage of nominal owners like absentee shareholders uh, with with their actual control mediated entirely through these managerial systems. And the interesting thing about it is that you know if we think of uh, the, this idea of stakeholder capitalism, there's 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 like an interesting. Um, there's an interesting truth to the idea that that 
you know, the corporation does not exist only to maximize shareholder value. And this is sort of the, the maximally provocative way that I think Milton Friedman put it originally. Like, you know, the, the only social responsibility of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. Um, I think, you know, that, that's, that idea obviously is full of holes. And so they, they attack that with this idea of shareholder or, or stakeholder capitalism. But like you say, it's, it's anti-founder. But interestingly, it's also anti-state. There's, there's this other... There's this other interpretation of the duties of corporations, which is sort of, again, the more original do interpretation, which was the corporation is a chartered arm of the state. It says you are allowed, like I'm going to give you a charter as the state, as the sovereign to delegate solving this particular problem to these particular people in control of this, this legal entity, the corporation. And the corporation therefore has, you know, it has... Uh, stakeholders other than the shareholder that that stakeholder is the public it is the state right it, and it has some particular purpose that is supposed to be chartered to fulfill and you have some of this left over in the nonprofit world um you know like like for example with our nonprofit uh with palladium you know we have a charter which is we are supposed to carry out using the public's money a particular charitable mission not that anyone is checking these things too closely these days, but this was the original principle of the corporation was that it's, it says, okay, we're going to give you a grant of privilege, a grant of power, a grant of the state's power to carry out a productive activity. And it was this alliance between the, the sort of founder capitalist types and the state to, to carry out particular productive purposes. And the, the, uh, you know, then then you go to this this Milton Friedman version, which is actually we're going to throw out the state. You know, forget all of that. It's it's all these independent individuals. There is no society. There's only individuals, as Thatcher put it. Um, and, and and in that worldview, you know, the corporation has no responsibilities other than, than shareholder value. And then you go come out the other side of that, and you get back to no. Wait a minute. You need someone to. You need you need these things to be serving some larger logic. But they try to substitute a larger logic that doesn't involve any actual hierarchical coordination and and doesn't involve the state right so that's and that's how you get to this this idea of of stakeholder capitalism is, is you basically reject the the concepts of uh individual action and the concept of the state um so that's i find that interesting i find it um important to 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 put to to sort of clarify i think how how that happened and that there is this older model of the corporation almost as like a chartered arm of the state that has responsibilities to more than just profit profit is this incidental thing but there's there's the charter you're actually supposed to do the thing you're supposed to you know stay within certain bounds and accomplish a certain mission the, but this brings us back to this question of how these are questions of political economy right it's who who are the key players here whose interests are being represented and what's the deal between them? And and this again brings us back to these questions of, you know, uh, the exhausted capitalist elite making a deal with the managerial elite, um, or or and how that could be done differently. Um, so I find that fascinating: is how these things could be done differently. Can you actually unfreeze some of these ceasefires in a way that doesn't just result in, you know, the first half of the twentieth century all over again? Um, and it comes back to some of these virtues without without the the violence. One of the things I want to emphasize here is that you know we talk about deals, right? But let's be clear, these are often discovered deals and equilibria rather than things that are explicitly negoti negotiated. Right, right. When in 1890 there is a big trend of uh, you know the heiresses of the very first generation of American industrialists uh, and the heirs flying to Britain. You know, sorry, not flying, pardon. That's a anachronism. Sailing to Britain <laughs> and marrying a down on their luck, you know, down on their luck uh, aristocrats. You know, I think that's a discovered deal. It's sort of like you need respectability, you need responsibility. There's a class that has accumulated that over time. And, uh, you know, even in America, in this like anti aristocratic context, being married to a British lord in 1890 was a hell of a status flex, you know? And I think there's something perhaps similar happening today between the West and East Coast of the U.S., though maybe that's its own topic once more. 
so I think these things are often discovered incrementally, but they can be engineered as I try to illustrate both with the Jesuit example and, you know, the example of Vladimir Lenin. Uh, but, you know, we can also use the example of America's founding fathers, right? They created and organized a, an American colonial elite. The first impulse of this elite was not independence, right? The first impulse was to try to get a deal working with London. Uh, that just didn't didn't end up happening. Right. I'm very interested in this this core topic that we seem to be circling around, which is the cycle of kind of elites becoming elite classes becoming exhausted um, by various means and then and then either cutting deals or failing to cut deals with with new incoming elites. So there's all kinds of things we could say in sort of how the new elites come up into being that's of course of practical interest to anyone with ambition today, but also you know the the guidance on how these things are to be done properly if there is sort of a proper way to do it. I think one of the unfortunate things of I think 20th century mythology and perhaps perhaps earlier, but but you get a lot of this kind of uh, revolutionary assumption where it's like there is no possibility of making beneficial deals. There is only like revolutionary overthrowing. There's only like you know the existing elite that's exhausted and and or or just not quite as functional as it used to be or or you know for whatever reason it's in the decline. You know the only way to deal with that is is the guillotine. Um, and and like have a bunch of peasants rise up and, and cut all their heads off. I, I think that that mythology is both false and and like not not that's it, it's productive. It's very much false. Like the people doing the head chopping weren't um, you know they were not the peasants. In fact, the peasants rose rose up in favor of the king. Like in the Vendee, it was a new class of salaried uh, state bureaucrats, highly educated, descended from a mix of lower nobility and the upper bourgeois. But of course, like the moral justification was peasants versus versus kings. Um, I do think, though, that, you know, it's very notable. There's an excellent book uh, by Gregory Clark titled The Sun Also Rises. The sun as in descendant, not the stellar object. Uh, and in it, he notes that there's solid data to indicate that, for example, in the modern Japanese diet, the Japanese parliament, uh, you, in fact, have a positive correlation between membership in parliament and descent from samurai families. That's after American occupation. That's after the Meiji Restoration. Note the Meiji Restoration disempowered the samurai class, right? And in the Soviet Union also, the, he cites good data showing that there was a positive correlation between being descended from nobility and being a member of the Communist Party. So even when the narrative is one of struggle and replacement, I think it is unavoidable. It is whether we like it or whether we hate it, it's a politically unavoidable reality that in, that in the wake of every revolution, a shocking amount of the old elite is reintegrated on a new principle into the new elite, even if the new elite doesn't want it. So... I think it's much healthier to have processes of historical evolution and of symbiosis than the more destructive process that ends up in the same place anyway of of revolution and of of struggle. Right. And and it's this revolutionary mythology it kind of uh, obscures the question that got me onto this which is well what if there's a proper way to do these things? Like what if we can understand this as something that inevitably happens? And understand that there's there's sort of um, not quite best practices, but you can you can approach it in a manner that is is smooth and natural and doesn't have to involve all the chaos. And this so this is what's interesting to me about this question of elites sort of recognizing that they are they they no longer really want the responsibility, they no longer want, really want to play the real game, and they're going to yield to these more ambitious uh, outsiders in exchange for some kind of deal. And it, like that seems very much like that might be the proper way to do it. And and this you know the it, why why might an established elite take that deal? This is sort of this question again for the the people who think that it's all just domination hierarchies and there's no such thing as decline. I think what you get over time is that any class decays in its original virtues. There's there's some need to innovate the virtue at the beginning 
uh, that that forces them to so some some existential need that forces them to develop this virtue. They gain that virtue, and then on the basis of that virtue, they gain quite a bit of position and power. Uh, the need recedes to some extent, and you know the, there are still pressures to maintain certain very important virtues. Um, as you mentioned, Samuel, like the the sort of aristocracy accumulating this prestige um, and accumulating a sort of respectability, which is actually, I think, a, a cultivated virtue, not just sort of something that anybody could accumulate. You get some extent the continuing to generate virtue, but you also get loss of of these important virtues, and in particular, loss of coordinated ambition, loss of the kind of spirit that you need to do ambitious new transformations of society. And, and so, you know, someone in that position, looking at that situation, they say, okay, I am currently privileged. I don't have the ambition or the, or the, the skills or the talents or the coordination with my comrades necessary to do ambitious transformations of society. I can see that these transformations maybe need to happen, but I can also see that, that we are no longer the ones that are going to be doing it. And so then in that position, that's why an elite can say, okay, I, I, we actually do want to sell out to the newcomer. Well, we want to, we want to mentor the newcomer sometimes. Yeah. Right? We want to, we want to, we want to hand over what we had to them, right. In, in a way that, you know, we get to keep our privileges, but we get to, we get to mentor them up. We get to give them the things that we care about, teach them how to steward them. And they get to bring in their virtues and their ambition and their dynamism. And so this is sort of the ideal of the way it could go, right? But sometimes this process, you know, it, it can work well or it can work poorly. I agree with you, however, that we need to firmly establish this idea of a, of a, of a righteous or harmonious even, you know, to invoke the Chinese concept, uh, transfer of power between elites. I sort of feel the so-called transfer of power that happens in democratic elections is a bad parody of this process. It's an emptied out shell of what actually um, I think is a real and important ideal. Like sort of the ancient Greek perspective on the kiklos was, you know, the kiklos is inevitable. The shifting between the forms of government is inevitable. But the sort of strife, destruction, and transitory period you have optionality as to how you handle those periods. And I think I think even today, you know, in the United States, I feel there is an a level of the professional capital managers and the professional company managers as well as the sort of professional people managers. So, professional capital managers, Wall Street to the first approximation, professional people managers, Harvard MBAs to the first approximation. Uh, professional, um, you know, just sort of the HR lady is like sort of the last, the third sort of elite. I think they're all really drained at this point. And I think they would do well to try to bet on new elites. I think one of the failures of America right now has been a failure to properly integrate the old generation of tech elites from the 2000s. They might have an even deeper failure in trying to cultivate the positive potential of, say, um, crypto wealth and crypto elites, where I have to honestly say, I think Vitalik Buterin is like almost the exemplar of that. I don't know of anyone better where he uses his money pro-socially. He understands it's not just his role to make number go up, okay? His role is to actually support science and occasionally support art. And, you know, gosh, you know, it's terrifying, but sometimes he loses money. He sometimes gives away money. He doesn't just, you know, hodl, right? He, of course, you know, cares deeply about Ethereum working and, you know, he thinks about it. He applies himself, but he also is willing to delegate and work with others. And this is like an example of noblesse oblige. I'm going to claim that there is an element, you know, I don't believe in, in sort of um, a just world necessarily, but I think there's much more justice in it than modern people would want to admit. And if you have a class that becomes wealthy but lacks noblesse obligé, I believe the rest of society will conspire and they will find a way to eliminate this wealth.
yeah i mean it doesn't even have to be the rest of society i think it's just like there's these there's these it's very self-destructive. fundamental it's kind a of self-destructive pattern yeah, of behavior right there's these very fundamental natural laws where like if you are if you are lacking the virtue that that is necessary to your station in society then you know the thing is going to fail and and it, one way or the other whether whether it's people kind of throwing you out or whether it's it's sort of god throwing you out so to speak because you're you're whatever you're maintaining is actually just failing and and that was your base of power um i i think this is a, an important fundamental fact to understand um you know in contrast to you know i've said this before in contrast to kind of the democratic ideology where the only threat to the elite is is you know the 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 uprising of the masses and and which i think unfortunately creates this sense of antagonism between elite and masses but yeah so so back to this question of of like are are the current elites in america doing a good job of integrating new elites i think as you as you point out i think no there isn't really that happening in a very good way there aren't people like i think people like like elon musk and and vitalik and uh you know patrick carlson and others in the in the in the sort of silicon valley world or the or the extended silicon valley world it doesn't matter if they're it doesn't matter if they're technically based in canada or, or austin all of us know that you know right, what right, that right. means yeah <laughs> right yeah so but there's there is this rising tech elite um and and there is this sense of antagonism now the antagonism is always a little bit uh inevitable but but perhaps we could do a better job kind of integrating these things and recognizing that that's where a lot of the ambition is well it's it's also a little bit deserved because so few of them are pro-social in the way that say a patrick Carlson or an elon or a vitalik is right and so this is maybe the flip side of the whole thing is well the other problem is that we actually have so few worthy rising elites in america we you know you mentioned the crypto class Um, you know, and unfortunately, apart from a few big names that are obviously doing something different, you just have this, this vast, uh, vast horde of people who, who basically are interested in line, go up, they're interested in memes and they're interested in, in, in like only this, this sort of ownership state. I I feel, I feel they're not interested in being a ruling class. They're just interested in skipping that stage and going straight to being in the golden cage. Right, right. It's something like that. It's like the golden cage of the current society has been, you know, has been so comfortable and and so mythologized for so long that that people just that's that's directly what they want. They just want to like, you know, go to Yale and and dress like a wasp and and have wealth and not really do anything ambitious and just sort of be retired as a class. And and this is this is unfortunately where a lot of the ambition is going in our society is trying to LARP as the people who are in their position because they've lost ambition, and and it, it's like there's lack of vision or somehow, um, and so I think that's unfortunate. But this is not unique to crypto at all. Like I don't want to single out that that sector. I mean they they are even some of the most dynamic and some of the most interesting as compared to everything else that's going on but it's it's just like there's this inadequacy uh of of rising elites there's, and and this creates this sort of necessary succession failure um so this is and this is maybe part of uh this was a huge component of what we covered in palladium 4 on cultivating elites because this is this problem right we need to cultivate new elites who are going to come in and take up the reins of society what does that look like and, and so your article on rising elites comes in in this section. So we, we broke we broke the magazine into three sections. And the third section is about kind of from the perspective of the rising elites, what can we do? There's there's a lack of of rising elites. There's a lack of institutional support for rising elites. What should young, ambitious people be doing? Is Is it just going to school? Like, you know, we have a whole section on how the the elite schools are kind of dysfunctional but okay then what what do we actually do and and so this this is this very uh fascinating application of your article which is basically this blueprint of here's what it looks like for someone to gain access and gain power as an individual um as as they're sort of building new new forms of power new forms of usefulness that don't exist within the current order and 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 rising so i i find that that is that is in some ways some one of the most important questions right now it's like how how do we 
blaze a path or or show the way for people who are ambitious to become a true virtuous ruling class instead of just uh you know attempting to join the sort of retired capitalist class which is unfortunately what happened to a lot of sort of silicon valley founders you, you know like you get rich you you built some some company but it didn't really transform society in the way you wanted. And now you just have a bunch of money and a bunch of scrutiny and you can't trust anyone. And you basically, you're only, you're only, the only thing you can do is kind of just retire with your money and like tinker on, on things and maybe invest in your friend's projects. Um, and this is this very sad outcome to the whole, uh, the ambition that, that Silicon Valley had. So how do we, how do we take it somewhere else? How do we take it somewhere other than that? And this is what I found interesting about your articles, Anna. I wonder if you have any ideas uh, for what, given the lack of of established paths or even semi-established paths or consciousness that there might be paths uh, uh, for rising elites to become a, a responsible and virtuous ruling class, what are the what are the things that we can understand that can improve that situation? I mean, I think partially a lot of it comes down to the understanding that so much of this is a social activity, right? It is often means investing in networks of people. It often means in, um, you know, uh, cultivating them, but, you know, growing them, but also gatekeeping them. Uh, it often means investing in, in sort of public public goods, at least from the perspective of your community, not even necessarily from, you know, uh, society as a whole. And these are perhaps like, you know, very basic things that everyone can do, but almost no one does them. I know it's shocking how often a good dinner conversation is undersupplied, how often a good party is undersupplied. How often organizing an event and inviting an interesting speaker is undersupplied. In an atomist society, almost everything that's sort of like a communal good is underprovided. On the one hand, this of course means that, you know, the skill to do this has diminished. On the other side, it means that the people who do show up, they have very little competition. I think honestly that a well-placed pro-social you know, open-minded socialite that knew how to distinguish the grifters from the thinkers and doers dropped into San Francisco is probably much more impactful at this point than an extra world, quote unquote, world changing startup. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. A competent socialite is very, very powerful thing right now. Exactly, right. Because w what they could do is help explain to people what it is, what is the next step, right? After you've made your money. Uh, and I think our society, I think one of the big lies of American society is that money equals power. I have to say, I know so many rich people who are so disappointed in how powerless they are and how stupid the things they are allowed to spend money on are. Like only yachts, you can spend your money on a yacht, you can spend your money on a big party. Um, you can spend it on escorts. You are definitely not allowed to give $50,000 to an internet weirdo to do bizarre scientific experiments <laughs> yeah. or to write yeah, a blog. You, 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 can, <laughs> you, you, can, you can spend it on a big party, but sort of only if it's uh, inconsequential. It, it has you know, to be like inconsequential, it, it, yeah. Right, because like, there are very powerful things you can do with a party if you invite the right people but like of course you know that's that's um, i mean that's already that's already a hit piece in the making right if you invite yeah, the yeah, wrong you're, people you're, right which and, is to say the right people <laughs> which is to say the right people and honestly even you know creating nonprofit media organizations you know i i hate to you know use palladium as an exemplar um but i think it's Im immensely powerful precisely because it's not trying to make a profit you know, I think, I think trying to make a profit in the media business in 2022 is a mistake, but trying to have an impact in the media business in 2022 is not a mistake. And right. And this is the point, this is the point in my article, quit your job, which is like more generally quit the, the money brained mindset, um, which is, you know, of course not an original take to me. It's, I, I get it 
at least to some degree, some large degree from Thoreau, who's writing in the early 19th century. And he sees this pathology in American society of people kind of chasing the money, chasing the wealth, but not in any way that actually enables them to do anything that they want. They actually end up just kind of deeper enslaved into that. But but it strikes me, one of the things you said um, about you know, how little competition there is for, for certain types of social value creation, like, you know, throwing a party or, or uh, a good dinner conversation or uh, an event where you invite a speaker and, and invite some interesting audience members that are well selected. Like those things are, they're undersupplied, I think, because there's no direct commercial stake. It's very hard to imagine a direct commercial stake in things like that. And and so much of our society has become optimized around the direct commercial stake. You do things on this very linear, like how does this increase shareholder value or how does this increase like, you know, our, our ESG goals or whatever, like whatever sort of metric you're using, it, it's this very uh, straightforward um greedy consequentialism of of chasing those things and not taking these these kind of more roundabout but ultimately still very valuable uh roots and and the interesting thing is like for someone who was that competent socialite who just comes in and throws a bunch of the right parties that actually is a very lucrative career path like i think that person ends up getting rich anyways uh, because they make so many interesting and useful connections. But it's just like no one's thinking in those terms because no one has narrativized it, no one has made it a thing, and no one no one is quite quite ambitious in the right manner. And and I, I, I think one of the things like you you uh you mentioned that you know this this hypothetical ambitious socialite could be um you know, could could have this position of influence and like tell people how to how to become a ruling class or something. But I don't think it even has to get to that point. I think it can be much more humble and much more, um, it, you know, almost lacking in ambition. It's just they're doing this thing that they think that they feel is valuable. And l- like, we, you know, we have friends like this. Right. And where they're out making social connections. They have no particular interest in any particular agenda. They're just trying to make valuable social connections. They're just trying to like keep a scene going. And those people end up very weirdly influential, even if they're not even trying to be, and even if they don't even want to be. Um, they're just trying to make connections between their friends that that seem interesting. Um, and I think I think that's something that that people need to understand is like how sort of humble that job is and yet high return if you actually just do it and take it seriously um and yeah so this is this very interesting fact about the landscape as it is is there's these very established paths to you know wealth and and prestige and so on but but increasingly as you look at those you realize that they don't lead anywhere they lead somewhere you get the big you get the tie score you know you get your hundred million dollars and it's the high score or whatever but but like it's just a high score in a video game at the end of the day like maybe you get a well, a yacht it's like oh great you get to like keep playing the game with with bigger loot like it, but it's it's it doesn't have this larger consequence as much certainly not as much as it claims to have and so you see you see on the one hand that where you have this hyper competition increasingly difficult competition for increasingly less valuable established credentials and established money uh, established forms of wealth. And then on the other hand, you have this wild west of, of, you know, underserved needs that are not yet institutionalized, but are the source of outsized influence and power if you are creative about it, if you actually have a conviction to take that leap of faith. And so this is this very interesting social condition to be in. Um, because what it means is that you're going to get these people who are ambitious in these more game-breaking ways they're going to realize that the mainstream paths of success even the supposedly disruptive ones that have become commodified are not actually as interesting as finding ways to sort of break out of the system and so that's that's this i mean some people would call it a pre-revolutionary condition i think it's not 
necessarily revolutionary, you know, especially in light especially of... Especially because I feel like, the, you know, despite revolutions being failure modes in a way that we discussed mm-hmm. earlier, they are acts yes, of exactly. agency and they require live players. And I'm just going to say the deep <laughs> pacification of American society, you know, sort of leaves me aghast, you know, and um, to be fair, it's comparable to Europe where, you know, in East Germany, the most authoritarian place you can imagine where everyone is spied on by the Stasi and everyone's demoralized and there are literal Soviet troops in the country. When, you know, when uh, the government decides that the coffee mix is going to have only 51% real coffee instead of 60% real coffee, there's a riot (laughs) over food quality, okay? When in America, the content of soy or it goes up or insect uh, protein goes up in the hamburger, there's no riot. Uh, there's no riot in Europe either. <laughs> to, to be fair, we haven't we haven't quite seen it get to that level yet. I can still buy meat at the supermarket, but you know maybe when those rationing measures come down the pipe, like we'll see if if the American if the American people have any energy left or not. But but yeah, it's it's like it, it, there's this weird sense where where American society is is somehow drained of energy despite being well, it's drained of political society. energy, right? It's 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 right. It's drained of political l- energy, libidinal. Yeah energies it's sort of um you know consuming energies they're all oriented in the video game right this this the critique of the critique of hyper reality is the same as the critique of the matrix is the same as sort of the critique of of this like selling out concept it's the view that you accept someone else's game as your ultimate end and you exhaust yourself in pursuit of a goal in the competition itself. And to be fair, I do believe that, you know, there's something interesting about competition. But I think wanting what other people want is the surest way to join one of the teams pulling the rope and never, ever pulling the rope sideways, which would be actually the most impactful thing you could do. Yeah, it's like wanting what other people want those things tend to be sort of already harnessed. Like if there's a whole bunch of people in society applying a force in some way, then probably what you have is some more creative person harnessing that force for their own ends somewhere. Like as soon as you have those those uh, those sort of reliable forces, they can be redirected around quite quite uh, efficiently. I think this is something that that people don't realize that in complex systems, you know, the obvious application of force towards your goals by a lot of people, for example, um, doesn't necessarily contribute to those goals. It rather just, it creates, it just adds energy to the system in this way that can then be captured and redirected and, and ends up somewhere totally different. Like you mentioned, you mentioned how effective the left has been through the 20th century. Well, one thing that has happened recently to the left is, is there, you know, since, you know, ni- the the WTO riots maybe are like this this interesting milestone. When did those get started, by the way, if you if you recall? I think I'm that was the late 90s. Late I don't 90s, recall the exact yeah. dates. I think it's late late 90s, WTO riots in Seattle. You know, this huge show. Those were a by prototype, the, by the, the way, like, followed in, in Germany and elsewhere. Right. A huge, huge, huge showing by the insurrectionary leftists. Um, in some ways successful at, you know, disrupting this thing that they wanted to disrupt. But but then, you know, over the next 20 years through Occupy and other things, what you have is this total recuperation of of in the the technical sense of recuperation. Right. Yeah. Recuperation in the sense that 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 energy is still being applied by a lot of idealistic people. But now it's it's been jujitsued into like you know, the Marxists are all basically shilling for the interests of particular corporations. And like, you know, they've they've equated the the billionaire oligarch with, oh, only the bad billionaire oligarchs who aren't coordinated with the current like sort of main plutocracy system. I know you have issues with the, the term plutocracy. The term plutocracy, but like, I think, yeah. 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 But but like there's, I there's prefer, something I prefer, there. I prefer the term oligarchy, right? Because it, it right. doesn't, you know, I honestly don't think, you know, it really matters if it's uh, right. you it's know not really comrade if it's, if it's technically <laughs> comrade khrushchev's dacha or if comrade khrushchev gets to use the dacha and it's technically the people's dacha i feel like these are details 
And the control of material wealth in particular is greatly overrated compared to the control of social wealth. And, you know, I, I don't want to be maximally controversial. So I'm just going to say, let's say the social capital of Bill Clinton is not well measured by uh, dollars, by dollar <laughs> <Yes>. signs. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's call it the oligarchy. But the point being, like, you you have these anti-elitist, anti-oligarchy people who seemingly coincidentally are only anti-oligarchy when it's the guys who aren't coordinated with the main bulk of the oligarchy. So it's like, okay, what you have is that energy has been totally recuperated and turned around on itself and made to serve made to serve its enemies. You know, it, and, and it's like, you know, Antifa becomes the fascist, you know, black shirt militia uh enforcement arm of of capitalism right it's like I, i'm putting that sort of in maximally ironic terms but like there's a way in which that's true and and it's like this weird thing where you know despite a lot of people putting a lot of energy into the system it ends up recuperated it ends up it ends up redirected and and it it um doesn't have the effect that it nominally intends and so this well, is this very of, important thing to understand is- Part of it is, I think that you know the view that you can exist. Well, first off, look, you have to find, you have to find the human capital for a rising elite. You have to find a socioeconomic niche that is sustainable. So, even though we critiqued the perspective of money making, I think um, the compassion. You do need money. <laughs> you do need. Well, you need wealth. Now, whether money is wealth anymore is its own provocative right. question, okay, right? The joke being, I, I saw this somewhere, I think it was on Twitter. Someone, someone said that, you know, being a millionaire in America today is about the same as being a mailman in 1953. You get to have a nice right. house, <laughs> you get to have a wife, you get to have a, a car, and you get to live in a safe neighborhood. Yeah, maybe you even get to send your kids to college. <laughs> maybe you even send your kids to college. I mean, it's expensive, but you can afford it uh, if you're a mailman in 1953 or if you're uh, a millionaire in 2022. So that's why I think the differentiation between wealth, uh, which has both a material and a social component. I think wealth, right. class, and money tend to be conflated, but they're all three very different concepts. So this... This gets again to this thing that is hard to articulate because, well, the very language is debased sometimes. Yes, intentionally, yes. It's, it's sometimes like by the, persistent delusion. So, so it's just difficult to grasp. Yes, it's difficult to grasp, and this is this is this this point that I'm making about like you know the well tracked, well established, well articulated path has been sort of sapped of its real energy. And the high energy alternate paths are totally illegible. And like you and can't sometimes see them even doing... actively demonized, right? Or actively right. Or, discouraged. Or, yeah, to the extent that they're even understood, right? It, it's it's like the the point is sort of that that like you're you have to take this leap of faith to to like bet on this thing that everyone else is not betting on. Even if it's like that's where the actual energy is, that's like you know, like let's talk about this concept of wealth as we as we have been. You know, do you want to treat wealth as money? Wealth can be dollar valued, or is wealth this other thing that you actually don't know how to measure, but you know it's a way better way of thinking about it? And and the thing about about the dollar value thing is it's like it it allows you to like you know count your beans and stack your sats and like make a line go up, but but you you know, maybe you don't get anything at the end because everyone else also has nine go up style, style of money or because that whole system has been co-opted or, or recuperated to be useless. But there's these other forms of wealth, these social forms of wealth, these network forms of wealth that are less easy to, they can't be articulated. They can't be quantified. And that's almost part of why they are valuable because they're the things that other people don't know how to pay attention to. And if you can figure out how to pay attention to them, which is non-trivial, like you can't just go and 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 like, oh, I'm just going to chase forms of wealth other than money. And you're not just going to get that right. If But if you can get that right, then you have something very powerful. If you can figure out how to measure that thing for yourself, then you've done something novel. And that's 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 how these big shifts in the political economy happen is you find out new like new ways for accounting for things, new ways of accounting. 
And, and instead of just counting the money exchange value, like we do all our accounting on the basis of exchange value in, in current society. But what if there are other forms of accounting? What if someone figures out a way to account for the kinds of strategic social uh, leverage wealth that, that I think we're trying to talk about here, but we don't have the terms for? If someone does that, you get a new political economy. Well, well really, in a very strong and interesting way, I would say that Instagram influencers were in their moment as interesting an innovation as cryptocurrencies were because for the first time ever, clout seemed to have a number, right? The number was the follower number, or whatever, yeah. or the and, engagement number. And, and not just a number, but it had it had leverage, right? Like you it had economic leverage and social leverage and connection leverage. Yeah. Right. And and so but of course, as soon as it's as soon as it has become articulated, as soon as it's measurable it becomes subject to competition. Um, and this is, so this is like- And, and that's this, why this I was speaking in problem. the past tense, right? I don't think people should become Instagram or even TikTok influencers right now. Right. It's like, it's like that's already kind of tapped out. It, it, and, and you have like, you're competing with millions of people who, whose entire way of thinking is optimized around competition on, on legible uh, metrics. And those people are going to beat you. And and the thing that you want to be good at that I hope the the Palladium audience is more interested in is, is the things where it's identifying something that that those people can't yet see and and chasing that, chasing these novel forms of wealth, novel forms of of uh power that haven't yet been articulated and thus haven't yet been colonized by by um the, the the competitive imitators i mean we could even be more concrete about this we could try to sketch out some of the opportunities we see where i would be provocative and i would raise six separate points right the first one is uh, i feel anyone today who has a guest house anyone who had a guest house through the length of the pandemic found their social capital multiplying at exactly the time when most of the upper middle class had atrophying social capital. If you were able to host someone for a month, not just an individual, ideally their whole family, right? Their wife and kids and so on. You were in an amazing position. How many people know to proactively use guest houses in this way? I bet there are some people in America's lower upper class that did this, but I think it's in theory, much more affordable to people of so many different social classes, yet done so infrequently. Um, the second example that I, I could, I would want to give, is basically intellectual independence and the interest in people. There's a big argument that you know it's a, it's a deep argument actually. It goes all the way back to the discourses on salt and iron, uh, in imperial China. Is STEM a distraction? Right. I, I studied physics, actually. Right. So spatial thinking, right. Spatial IQ, math equations. Right. What if these are all big distractions? In a way, America remains a word dominated society. It's a media dominated society, a law dominated society. Maybe the go study STEM. There's so much demand for it is actually perhaps good for your bank account if you can pivot into programming. I would argue studying STEM, if you can't be in programming, is actually a bad deal. But if you can then pivot into programming, it, software engineering, it turns out it was a good deal. Uh, I think the most powerful people who have a software engineer background are people who excel at speaking words to other humans, at, at talking about concepts anew, right? If I needed to name examples, I would make I would name some brilliant designers of you know everything from like you know uh, Jonathan Blow, the designer of Braid, uh, to people like Paul Graham, who you know not just created YC but became a well-read blogger, and so on and so on. Right. So I think self-studying humanities is a unique power that no one is encouraging you to pursue. Right. And and so I think just to articulate that a little more, I think what it is about STEM that's valuable is that it gives you a different way of thinking, a different intellectual mode of being, a different way of knowing than, than uh, the, mo the like mainstream kind of verbal power structure is used to. And if you are creative, you can leverage that in interesting ways. 
Um, but the STEM thing itself in its domain is not that useful. You know, I used to be in STEM. I, I was trained as a mechanical engineer. I worked in that field for a little while. I got out of it because there actually isn't really much you can do there. And, oh, look, I'm in the sort of more verbal domain using that way of knowing. But I think I think that's just I just wanted to articulate that. I think it's it gives you a way of knowing that you can use to leverage. But, but you, have other to, things. you have to be willing to use it. Right. I think there's a weird almost sigh up where people in STEM believe they are pure and morally better because they they never think about power. <laughs> right. Right. Oops. <laughs> and I think. Yeah, that, I think that's that's a mistake that makes you someone else's servant. And just to be clear, I think there's an ability in serving. And I think especially one of the more neglected, the third neglected way of um, achieving power is to make yourself indispensable to someone you believe is a live player, to someone you believe is an agentic person and, you know, achieves achieves things and also, of course, takes care of you, right? You you shouldn't get exploited in the process. Yeah, it, it, it's shocking how many people nominally want to support something, but don't go out or someone, and I see this all over the place, and but don't go out of their way to be like, okay, I'm going to disrupt my life to sort of entrepreneurially seek a way to aid that thing. And and if they the people who do do that, they they end up very successful at it because they are the pe like people need that people need those those supporters and they need those uh, useful lieutenants and so on. But but without people kind of uh, volunteering themselves into those positions, it's actually quite hard to get. But if you can just volunteer yourself into that position, which requires a little bit of a leap of faith, because it's not a for sure thing that you're going to be able to be successful at that. But if you have that dynamism, if you have that ability to take a leap of faith, I think that's I think you're absolutely right, Samo, that that's a, a very powerful thing to do. Yes. And I, I think it's something that, you know, <laughs> it's a big investment, but is it really, you know, just compare it to college? OK, this didn't give you forty thousand dollars of debt. It did not require four yeah, but years it's a of your best years. It's a non-standard. It's thing. a non-standard investment. And that's this is what people are really afraid of. Right. That's what makes it a leap of faith. It, it's like you have to do something on your own judgment where society is not going to validate you for it. And to be fair, you, you know, in a good society, you probably shouldn't use your own judgment or in a functional one, right? Like, if, yeah, like, but if things were working well, level of dysfunctional. Right, right? No, no, I, I agree there. But I do think we have to be honest here. Like one of the things I always find funny is, uh, you know, you know, venture capitalists, when they encourage you to take risks, do not necessarily have your best interests at heart. They just want to increase the number of companies they can invest in. And the failures, they don't, re those don't really matter to them. Right. So I do think we, I also want to like give some caution to the listeners and say that, you know, the attrition rate for trying to become an elite is pretty high. Uh, it's not literally, you're not going to die, but if you give it your best shot and you try, like, I think you're going to have a shockingly good chance of success. I think if you give it your best shot and you really try and you, 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 you keep it, you, you try to be like both ethical and savvy, right? Like, you know, it's, the sort of there's a there's a quote by I think literally Jesus that escapes me. I'm I'm fortunately not religiously educated enough. Something like like as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, right? So if you can actually maintain ethical integrity, and by the way, ethical integrity is a tactical resource, okay? And be, you know, tactically savvy simultaneously. I think you probably have like a ten or fifteen percent chance of joining the elite. And honestly, isn't that way higher than the odds of, you know, getting your kids into Harvard? If you've not already gone to Harvard, it's way higher. It's still risky, but it's way higher. I mean, I, I sort of feel the need to immediately, like, point out that, like, joining the elite is not necessarily a good idea. What's a good idea is you want, you have something you particularly want to do, something that must be done that that in the course of doing that requires the accumulation of power that makes you de facto elite. And, and, and that, that I think is the way to think about it. It's sort of like related to the startup founder thing. Wanting to have a startup is a bad, it's a bad place to be. <laughs> right. It's, that is not, that is not how you, that is not what works. What the, the, the motivation that actually works is I want to solve this problem and no one else is going to let me do it. So I have to do it myself. And, uh, which reminds me, you know, uh, 
related to to these these things we've been discussing paul graham has this great little quote um that that most startups don't fail because they run out of money or because they because they uh you know get blown out some way they fail because they stop trying they give up and and like as long as you sit there and keep working on it you're probably not gonna fail or like that massively increases your chance of success and and he makes this very similar point it's like oh look if you if you undertake this startup thing and just don't give up you have a like a fairly high chance like maybe 20 percent of you get rich and then it's like you know isn't that worth spending your youth on this is the argument he makes and i think you're making a similar argument samo though of course i would also caution against trying to get rich for similar reasons i mean like what, what i was trying to say is um you know it's I did not want to dismiss the risk of success. Like from the perspective of society, it's always better to have someone succeed at something very difficult for an individual to attempt something very difficult. It just might not, you know, it just might not pass cost benefit. Um, But then if you find yourself driven uh, that you just sort of can't live life without attempting something like something you really care about, then you should not avoid, you shouldn't let the fact that, oh no, trying, you know, you shouldn't let the fact that in order for me to do this, I have to end up being seen as an elite. Like that shouldn't stop you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you have to be willing, you have to be willing to be over ambitious and hubristic or at least be seen as such. Um, But of course, you have to be cautious not actually to be overly, like trying to grab the banana out of the jar but but like it's this difficult balance but i to- i totally agree like if that is your niche in the world just do it but like don't do it for imitative reasons well well it's it's even what i was going to say as i so i see so many people who have these very strong drives often very pro social drives often coming from their best rather than the worst impulses and then they spend so much of their personal energy stopping themselves from acting on their best impulses. And I'm just sort of looking at, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the situations, I'm talking to them, and I realize, you know what? Actually, you know, the worst impulses aren't restrained in this way. Just you're just stopping your best impulses. Right. Right. I'm curious to hear the rest of your list, if you can still remember them, the, the underrated forms. D- did, of, I, did I list five ambition. or did I list six? Or <laughs> I've heard three. I've, I've heard, heard three. three. You oh, said I, six. I already, th- I already said three. Um, no, yeah. You said, th- you said three. I heard, I heard six was ah, your total count. Okay. okay. Well, then let's go for the other three. <laughs> let's see if I can hold you And that. where we can cut down that list, right? The first one was the guest house technology, if I'm being playful with it. But it's actually a stand-in for the willingness to provide space for other individuals as they both figure themselves out and as they get to know you to forge lasting long-term bonds and not relying on things like coffee shops, which might be closed down due due to a COVID order, right? Or something silly like that, right? Um, And and honestly, it's, it's far less owned, right? If you meet someone in a coffee shop, like basically we had number two and number three. If I were to add number four to the list, um, you know, this is sort of like there was this original thinking, this like verbal, verbal thought. I think my number four would sort of be being gainfully unemployed, which I think you, you raise in your own article. I think this is one of the few things techies do well. It's disappointing they don't do more with it. But the idea that you should retire at 32 if you can and try to do something interesting is extremely valuable. It's just disappointing. Or, all of or- Mm. or retire at 23 uh or 23. like i did i I, I was calling myself temporarily retired at 23 because I'd, I'd made enough money to like goof off for a couple of years which was not all that much money but because i was living a cheap lifestyle i think i think living frugally while pursuing something important on your own terms is very much underrated i mean i had the similar experience where i just spent my early 20s in this very low cost living lifestyle uh, I was sort of living the way a student would live, but I wasn't being a student, right? I was I was self guided study at that point. I had I dropped yeah, that, that was like when when you were working at the library, exactly like getting all library jobs, like occasionally moonlighting a software, just keeping expenses low but freedom high. 
I think number five, it's sort of, um, if you can do it, look, if you can do it, talk to strange people, but be prepared. They can be hazardous. So what do I mean? I mean, people from very different subcultures to your own, um, strange groups on the internet, uh, they're going to unfortunately have a higher than usual incident of antisocial personality uh, disorder or whatever you want to think of it, like hazardous people, right? Like like uh, marginal ideas always and in all places attract marginal people, but all the marginal gains are to be had by pursuing marginal ideas. So if you can, you know, if you can uh, get that blowfish without, you know, being killed by its toxin, go for it. Okay, go for it. Don't encourage necessarily others um don't like talk about it too much do note the limits of it don't be fooled into thinking that these communities have your back because they won't right because they're just anons on the internet or something or if they're not anons on the internet they're like weird art artist group houses in london or san francisco and it's in many ways toxic and bad but you know if you can descend into that mind you can you can exit it too I think one of our earlier podcasts, Ash and I talked about this and uh, under the general heading of cults, um, where we advise <laughs> people framing. to join, jo- join as join many cults as you cult can. Leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, join, join many cults, get lots of experience with cults <laughs> because yeah, don't, don't get swept up. Don't get swept up in the nonsense, but it's like useful to be seeking, seeking after secret knowledge and like seeing human dynamics up close in weird circumstances that are not the normal. Anyways. Yeah. So I completely agree with that. Well, num- num- number six is it's going to be shocking, but you know, try to find friends and be loyal to them. Be loyal to friends and family. It sounds basic, but there's so few people who do it, you know, like actual social bonds of people right next to you, not imaginary people, five 500 miles away or 50 miles away or 5,000 miles away. It's just so hard and people don't do it at all. But the ones who do do it, you know, whatever critiques you might have of the current elites, you know, to a shocking degree, they take care of their own. Oh, yeah. 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 And this is, I mean, this comes back to like one of our theoretical points that I think, um, you know, people in our circles have made over the years, which is that, um, the reason the current establishment has the position that they do is because they are the ones who are most competent and deserving of that position. And if that's a disappointing fact about the world, well, then maybe you should be disappointed by the world and uh, maybe <laughs> and, do and better. Maybe do better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, okay. That's, that's a fascinating place. I think that's a good place to leave it actually. So your six points, I missed the, I, I forgot the third one. I, I remember it was good, but I've got the other five. So your, your guest house point, making, making your resources and your spaces available to other people, uh, it, it, just to, to build relationships with them and, and, uh, provide useful value. That is the people who can do that are gaining in social capital. Um, on the self-education point is number two that that like maybe stem is not as useful as as you've been taught but maybe it is as as a background way of thinking but you should definitely be self-educating in the humanities um sort of developing this 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 independent mode of thought the third one if you can remember it i'd love to hear it but i for, i've forgotten it. it's left in my mind the fourth one was this idea of sort of gainful unemployment i think um, I think you had a slightly wider point there, but that was the part I remember is gainful unemployment. Gainful unemployment um, is a is a good phrase. I hope it travels. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, quit your job, everyone. Uh, number five, weird ideas, weird people and cults um, and communities, just like j- these these sort of marginal spaces where, where you get interesting novelty. Um, hang out in those. I think those are those are very valuable. And six was loyalty to friends and family. So, yeah, so the, the, this this list was things that are currently not very well articulated within the kind of uh, the scripts of established ambition, um, but but are surprisingly valuable for for this sort of like outsized novel institution building path that that I think we're advocating here. So I, I have one more thing that I want to say on that path, um, one way to sort of articulate it. I've put it before in these terms. You have 
you have this term from from video games of all things of there's there's the game and there's the meta game and the game is sort of like everyone kind of knows what the game is there's this established thing with an established score established sort of scripts of performance and if you're really good at the game like you execute really well at what's going on uh at, at the sort of established mode uh you can do well but at some point the game be, sort of becomes saturated by the 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 imitative the, the competitive imitator um and and they can be very good at that and there's this other path which is the meta game where it's you're sort of analyzing the thing from a more outside um perspective you're finding novel paths that are just totally different that change the game things that totally subvert the existing um paths of success that that circumvent the established metrics and people there's also this other class of people the the meta gamers who can find those and these tend to be different people um quite like like they they tend to uh, come from different backgrounds they tend to think differently they tend to they, they they play these games very differently but you get this like kind of constant playoff between the gamers and the meta gamers and the meta gamers are the ones who kind of break out of the established mode of play and find new ways of of playing the game and i think so one thing we're talking about here this 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 idea has been present throughout this whole discussion of kind of the the novelty comes from this meta game um disposition and so i just wanted to put that out there another another little meme for you but this has been a great discussion um yeah this so this this discussion obviously was centered around samo's article reform is driven by rising elites so reform is driven by rising elites was an article written by samo in 2020 we recently published it in palladium 4 you can get palladium 4 if you go to palladiummag.com subscribe if you subscribe um, we're still sending them out. So do subscribe, do get your copy. It's absolutely beautiful. We put in a lot of effort to make great art and, and a great selection of articles. Um, and my article that's in Palladium 4 that people are reading in print right now will be coming out online shortly. And, and you can read Samo's article in print. It's accompanied with, with great graphics and art. Um, so please do check that out. But I think that that's, uh, it's one of my favorite articles. And so, so thank you so much, Samo, for writing that and for coming on today to talk about it. Thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, it's a pleasure.